stream. I need to change the video resolution. What? Huh. I think they were still doing it when I did my first ones too. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we call them Hangouts still. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we're going out at lower resolution. Why? <clears throat> hmm. All right. So, we are live. Uh, Says the resolution is a little low. Is that is the resolution I, I okay just, on everybody's screens? I'm I'm talking to the, the audience well, now. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, unless you're watching the show as well, Dave. No, I got I just got the YouTube notification that the show went live. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, looks fine at 720. Okay, I can, I have so much internet now. I could be broadcasting this at 4K at 8K, but <laughs> but I have my show off. soft software <laughs> misconfigured. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of show off, now that I can share my screen, check this out. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'll change the scene. Oh, you're showing your speed, upload speed. <laughs> so did you get rid of Starlink? Yeah. Yes. I wish I had that choice, but um, yeah. you know, it's almost a game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's uh it's it's a it's a total game changer. I mean, now as we like before when I was having to upload my videos to the video editor, it would take me say 8 hours and now I can do it in about 5 minutes. Wow. Which is so great. So yeah. And people are saying buffering. It can't be coming from me. Am I dropping frames? Let me see. Yeah, I did drop some frames. Hmm. I wonder where that's coming from. Weird. I don't have anything going right now. Okay. All right. Buffering is, is okay. All right. Um, that's it. How, how, uh, well, I actually, I don't want to, I don't want to get a spoiler, Dave. So we'll talk about it in the, in the show about the, the actual, uh, all of the cool stuff that are, that's coming up next year. I guess it was during yeah. the speed test. I guess that was it. I guess as I was right, we got a buffer while I was doing the speed test. That actually makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you see the video or the picture the the article that nancy put up of all everyone's pictures and videos of the occultation yeah. of mars i didn't see her article but i saw a lot of the, i was clouded out here so i just vicariously yeah. watched it by everybody else but i saw some pretty amazing uh video i knew i would that's always those are always cool to see yeah 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 it was amazing just like all the yeah, we were clouded out too but just everybody's pictures yeah. uh, i think andrew mccarthy is becoming my favorite astrophotographer he he just does such amazing work just absolutely incredible mary mcintyre over in the uk she had i featured some of her she did a really cool sequence yeah. you, everybody yeah. in the uk saw it so yeah and then alan dyer is always such a solid photographer as well so, you, you yeah. cannot beat alan dyer for that kind of yeah, stuff i know i know yeah. yeah yeah i met him at a um i did a presentation for the royal astronomical society of canada and Okay. And met Alan, which was terrific. It was so fun to hang out. And yeah, we used some him. of his photography in the first book. Yeah. 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 yeah no, and he's often, he's one of your top people that you pick for any of your stories. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get started. So, apologies, everybody. I'm engineering the show tonight. We don't have Pamela's cool layout. So, we're just going to have to deal. Um, I didn't know that I would be, but, but it'll be totally fine. We've got good internet. So, let's just do it. All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, December 14th, the final episode of 2022. 
I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about comets leaving a dusty trail in the solar system. ESA's upcoming mission to figure out if Venus is volcanically active, the top astronomy events for 2023, as well as the top spaceflight events for 2023. We'll obviously be including the historic landing of the Orion capsule from the Artemis 1 mission, and we will be talking about briefly the pretty tremendous accomplishment in the fusion reaction that happened at the National Ignition Facility. Um, so we'll be talking about that as well. Joining me this week, we've got uh, Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Hey, Carolyn. Hey, Fraser. How's it going? Good, good. And we've got Dave Dickinson. Hey, Dave. Hey, still in a closet over a bar, but I have past internet. <laughs> yes, yeah, I can see your closet shelf and your... <laughs> do, you, do you have to go in there if you need to know like what day of the week it is? <laughs> all the calendars the i just calendar wanted something hanging. spacey up behind me yeah. i actually went around with a decibel app on my phone and found this was when they have the band playing downstairs this is the quietest place <laughs> when they have the band playing downstairs that's yeah. the which is right about now yeah that's the rough part yeah yeah um all right well before we get into uh this week's special guest i want to give a huge shout out to our good friends and fans of the weekly space hangout crew this is the community that will keep you entertained over the next few weeks of spacelessness. So join that amazing crew. Go to wshcrew.space. All right, let's get into this week's special guest. We've got Dr. Francis Halsen. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Well, the question I always ask people is, who are you and what do you do? Well, um... I was a particle physicist working as a theoretician. And uh, about 30 years ago, I started toying with the idea of doing neutrino astronomy. In fact, uh, that was an old idea by then. It's just that nobody had managed to do it. It was a technological problem. And so, um, you know, the took 30 years, but here we are. We finally found something in the sky that emits neutrinos, and we are totally confident about it. Now you're talking about the sun. No, no, no. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, so, in fact, as I'm a particle physicist, my interest in neutrino astronomy was not astronomy. I'm not an astronomer. My interest was to see how nature could accelerate cosmic rays to these huge energies. You know, the highest energy signals that reach us from the universe is not, uh, doesn't come to us in the form of light. It comes to us in the form of mostly protons. And so somewhere out in the sky, there is a proton accelerator, except that uh, probably many. In fact, we have already found two, so there are many. And uh, so they are like a hundred million times more powerful than the stuff we can build in Geneva. Right, right. And so, you know, I decided that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my life on, which I, which indeed it was. <laughs> so uh, the idea is, it's not just the neutrinos, of course, with neutrinos, you open a new window on the universe and God knows what you see, right? But there is another idea behind it is neutrinos can only be produced by proton beams. And so if you find a source of neutrinos, it's a proton or cosmic ray accelerator. And so you also solve the problem of where cosmic rays come from, which is a problem that's by now like, 112 years old. And these cosmic rays, these have been detected and the level of energy that's packed into this, in some cases, single atom defies comprehension. And for a long time, astronomers have been searching for the source. What could whip up atoms with this amount of energy and hurl them out into space? Well, what, what were the candidates? What did you what well, did you wonder they could be? Lots of them. And uh, we were not really worried about what the answer was 
we were worried whether we had be, really were building a telescope that was big enough. Hmm. And that was just a theoretical guess. And we were we were lucky. Uh, so as you we built a, a neutrino detector, which is basically a cube. It's actually hexagonal, but it's a kilometer in size. Right. And this and is so, the famous Ice Cube you know, Observatory in Antarctica. It took, us, it took us 10 years to find this source, 10 years of good data. So it's barely large enough. But now at least we know that active galaxies uh, are probably the culprit. So we don't have to worry about all the theories anymore that existed before. So, we so don't know whether they are the only source, but they... They somehow, from what we uh, published in Science a few weeks ago, so very close to the black hole, they somehow are accelerating these particles and then using them to produce neutrinos. All this seems to happen like within 10 Schwarzschild's radii. So can we, I want to understand the journey the mechanisms that are going on here. You've got this black hole that is somehow accelerating these particles. And at the same time, it's generating the neutrinos along with it. And they're going along with the particle at the same time in the same direction. Well, it does it exactly like you do it at a, at an accelerator on Earth, like at Fermilab, which mm -hmm. is close to where I'm sitting now. And uh, so somehow these, source, these high energy sources, they require an enormous luminosity. So you somehow have to tap gravitational energy. So in the inflow uh, into the black hole, somehow these particles get accelerated by tapping the gravitational energy. And then you have a particle accelerator. Right. Then to produce neutrinos, you have to shoot the beam into a target, which we think now is the dense cocoon that sits at the core of some of these active galaxies. So the neutrinos so, are being generated at the source at the soul as the as the cosmic yeah. ray is being and so then it becomes a neutrino star right so you just look at the sky and right. see what what comes at you right and then these neutrinos are traveling in this case tens of millions of light years reaching the earth passing through the atmosphere into the neutrino observatory and then interacting with the ice inside the observatory yeah that's it. Yeah. And, and, and so what are you use, looking for? What we how, use how... the ice as a particle detector. That's our telescope. You need a <laughs> particle detector. Right. And so, what what happens with the neutrino as it passes through the ice? Well, neutrinos, you know, they come in huge numbers. For instance, we estimate that we catch less than one in a million that are emitted by, by the source. But what happens is, and neutrinos, they're called ghost particle because they have no electric charge. So they just pass through the detector. The detector only can detect particles that have electric charge. So we only detect the neutrinos that crash into a nucleus of oxygen or hydrogen in the ice and then they make a, a nuclear splash of particles. And some of these have charges and those we see. Right. So the game is to look at these uh, patterns of light that are made when this neutrino makes a nuclear interaction. And from this pattern, we reconstruct the direction. So we have a telescope. And it's quite a journey when you think about it, that you've got some particle that's hanging out at the black hole. It's somehow falling into a particle accelerator around the black hole. It's interacting with dust around the black hole to generate this stream of neutrinos. They're making it all the way across the, you know, the, this 
enormous void of space reaching the Earth, going into the ice on planet Earth, and then releasing a different cascade of particles that you're then able to, yes. to decode. So there is nuclear physics on both sides. Right, yeah. To produce it and to detect it. And how are you able to know that you have the source? Well, uh, focus the telescope, as it were. Well, it's just like looking at the sky. You see a star suddenly, but it emits neutrinos. So, uh, as I said, we we saw a source uh, in 2017 as well. But that was a multi messenger campaign. This we did by ourselves. So that's much simpler simpler to explain. So if you look we actually see 100,000 neutrinos per year, but they are made in the atmosphere. So if you do neutrino astronomy, you look up in the sky, then you know you see neutrinos all the time, but they are of no interest. I mean, we use them to do particle physics, but that's a different story. And so the game is to look through the atmosphere and so what, first of all, there are two opportunities, right? If there is a star, I mean, they, the neutrinos will eventually accumulate and you will see more of them above background. And also they have typically higher energies. We can measure their energy. And so, uh, so you just, uh, we accumulate 10 years of data mm. and suddenly this blip appeared that... Uh, and we looked at the neutrinos in this blip and they had on average higher energy. So it just looked like a source. And then you ask the astronomers and they came from an active galaxy, which is relatively nearby, NGC 1068 or M77, depending on what you want to call it. So, so the concept, once you have the, the detector, the concept is, is relatively easy. It's it's kind of amazing. Like I think back at some of the original images of the night sky taken with radio telescopes. And with radio telescopes, they have to scan, you know, they only they can essentially measure the wavelength of the light and then they move on to another spot and then they slowly build up this very low resolution image of the sky. But over time, the resolution of these radio telescopes have gotten better and better. And you look at the new images that are coming out from say Meerkat and they look like photographs in the same way that it, like the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's in radio waves. And are we sort of at that first, st you know, like like I never thought of Ice Cube as a, as a telescope that's looking at the sky. I always thought of it as like a, a big blob of ice where you're detecting particles coming through it. But I can see as you sort of flip the whole thing around, you're starting to create this map of the heavens point by point. Do you foresee this time with new newer versions of the telescope, bigger versions of the telescope, uh, well, you start to build this map of the heavens that you're like, there's the Milky Way, there's Andromeda, but in neutrinos? Well, you see, uh, <laughs> we, we actually uh, don't think anymore about Ice Cube in the terms you just mentioned. We did originally. Yeah. Once it worked, we stare in our computer and look at a projection of the sky and see the neutrinos disappear, uh, the, appear and try to, to find some signal in it. That's the game yeah. we have to play the last 10 years. And so to make an analogy, one, this, this source that we detected by ourselves uh, and published a few weeks ago. It's uh, it's actually one of the first two active galaxies ever discovered. So uh, it was uh, one of the first two sources that Seifert discovered mm -hmm. in 1943. Right. So that's about to make the analogy. That's the stage we are at. Right. And if you are familiar with gamma ray astronomy done from the ground, for a long time there had only one source, and that was the crab. And we have actually two. And the advantage, of course, is once you have sources, 
you can begin to tune and improve your telescope right which we are you know trying which we are doing now in fact we went the part of the success of finding the source was due to recalibrating and redefining the the optics which of course are not lenses it's all particle tracks and light emitted in the eyes but uh so but that's that's the analogy you know all astronomy x-ray astronomy started by detecting one source right sco x1 yeah and there is a love a, a great story actually rossi who was uh, the pi he tried to publish it in physical review letters and they told him having a source like that is impossible and he wrote a letter back to the publisher and says i guarantee this source is real and they published it right. i cannot imagine i could write such a letter today <laughs> I, can, I guarantee and so you you briefly mentioned the 2017 the kilanova event did you detect neutrinos from the kilanova event no it was a month later we looked at the kilonova event but you know the kilonova event is a jet and it was not pointing at us mm. so to see the neutrinos it has to be pointing at you and we you know we had only one event and we were unlucky right we we'll have to get more but uh, a, a month later we saw really very high energy neutrino coming from another active galaxy TXS 0506 and uh, that was followed up by a lot of telescopes and the telescope saw this not only found the source they found variations in the source that were coincident with our neutrino right and so all the this evidence contributed by many telescopes I think so, the, when we wrote the paper there were some 20 telescopes that were authors of this paper. It was similar to, to the gravitational wave event. I... And so, uh, but there we needed help. This one we did by <laughs> ourselves. Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the wonderful things about neutrinos is they can pass through matter in ways that radiation just can't. You think about the neutrinos getting out of a supernova before the light itself can can get out. If you could see the sky in neutrinos, what would you see? Oh, yeah. In fact, I was going to mention this on one, uh, following up on one of your comments. We actually didn't see the galactic plane. So in every wavelength, color of light, you, the first thing you see in just geometry are the sources in your own galaxy. So we, you know, see it at a level of 10 percentage. And, uh, but uh, the universe in neutrinos outshines our own galaxy. So that means that there are sources in other galaxies and that uh, produce neutrinos that we don't have in our own galaxy. We are like a desert. Wow. And it's not difficult to guess. I don't know. But my guess is that it's because we don't have an active black hole. Right. So there's no zone of I... avoidance in neutrino, obser in, in neutrino astronomy. You can yeah. look right through the heart of the Milky Way to right. the other side. No problem. Right. Exactly. We look through the Earth as well, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. It so doesn't you don't matter what direction. To, through the Milky Way, we look right yeah. through the Earth. I mean, one of the most fascinating ideas is that our ability to observe the universe ends at the cosmic microwave background radiation when the universe was opaque. But I've got to assume that there was a lot of neutrinos being released before then. Can we oh, see those? Yeah. yeah, well, those neutrinos, there were, of course, neutrinos. Uh, there, are, the, the, there is a cosmic microwave background in neutrinos. Right, a cosmic neutrino background. Yeah. They have slightly lower energy and they are a bit fewer, but that's nuclear physics uh, that happened, you know, in the first three minutes of the universe. 
but uh of course those that's another dream right it it took uh after the discovery of cosmic rays and, and neutrinos it took us a you know it, it took us a century to yeah. find the source and so another dream of physicists is to find this microwave quote unquote background in neutrinos and people keep trying and uh there is a project uh still going on now but uh this is probably even more challenging than what we than what we are trying to do now but I know, uh, I know yeah the plan would... is to upgrade ice cube from its current one kilometer cube to 10 kilometers cube yeah what will and, that do do you think well it's clear i um uh, you know we see this too by the way in this analysis the second source we see is the source txs 506 that we first saw in the multi-messenger campaign in 2017. So this source reappears in our map now. Hmm. And so it's rather clear that when you look at this map, there are three sources that stick out. But, you know, you can imagine if you go a factor 10 in sensitivity, all these sources will pop up. And that's, you know, how you go from two ciphers and the crab in the case of TV astronomy to real astronomy. Yeah. We're not doing astronomy. Yeah. Uh, by any definition of astronomy. But so, yeah, we are, uh, we are at the moment, we have designed this detector. It's not quite finished. In fact, we submitted it to the Decadal Review as a project and they endorsed it. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually amazing, you know, because we are all particle physicists, right? I I never imagined anything I did would be endorsed by astronomers. It was such a great feeling. Right. And uh, so the big breakthrough, by building this detector, we managed to develop the technique and we understand the ice much better because the ice is our detector. So we did 20 years of R&D that can go into this next right, project. Right. And we can actually build a 10 times bigger detector for the cost of, of Ice Cube. So it's not like it's going to cost 10 times more, which... And, will, and will it be more. 10 times more sensitive? It depends what type of signals you are talking mm. about. But, uh, you know, it will be, for some things, it will be 10 times more sensitive for some things five times and for other things in between. Yeah. But so it's a general next generation uh, experiment. For two of the of the three neutrino flavors, it's it's going to be eight times bigger. And for the history of astronomy, astronomers have had one tool, electromagnetic radiation. And and now suddenly in the last couple of decades, we have three. We have just in the last few waves. years, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, no, no, and and in fact, the yeah, the the you know, we discovered the diffuse cosmic flux in 2013, and LIGO came in 2015. So, you know, th this just all happened in uh, in two two three years. Yeah, and. Amazing. If you imagine, both of us started this project in around 1990. So there was 10 years of absolutely nothing, just developing the techniques. Yeah, yeah. I, can you remember, like, was it, did it, like, occur to you at some moment? You're like, wait a minute, we built a telescope? Did that, was, was that always the plan or like like at well, some point did you go wait a minute like in a meeting or something you're like this is a telescope isn't it you know i this is not a a very romantic answer but my feeling was i remember i told you we had no guarantee that the kilometer cubed 
detector would be big enough to see this, to, to do astronomy. And uh, so the most exciting I got is when we finally detected neutrinos from the atmosphere, which was our background. And that proved that the technique worked. Yeah. And I say, now it's up to nature. I don't care. I'm not yeah. responsible anymore. We delivered the technique and it worked. And so the idea was, if you build something that big, can you imagine you're not going to discover something? It may not even be astronomy. You know, it could have been something related to neutrino physics, and which is another uh, interesting side issue. I mean, you would think that, you know, we have neutrinos that are 1,000 to 10,000 times more energetic than those you can produce in at an accelerator laboratory. You would think we discover new neutrino physics. No, <laughs> it's just a standard model. Right. It works perfectly. Right. Our detector works by, of course, if the neutrinos were behaving differently, we would have probably trouble doing astronomy. But once they figured out the flavor changing, everything had sort of wrapped up at that, that point. Well, it's it's an amazing accomplishment and congratulations. And I think like I've done a few videos on Ice Cube. It's gotta be one of my favorite instruments that's that's ever been built. I put it right up there with the square kilometer array and JWST and all these amazing observatories because Thank it, you. and LIGO because it just it gives astronomers, as I said, just another completely different way, an entirely new sense. And it's really exciting to he to imagine what future generations of astronomers will be able to do looking at something in gravity, to look in neutrinos, to look in electromagnetic waves, and to look at any problem from three perspectives. So it's an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations. If people want to find out more about your about your work, and you, the discoveries, what's the best place to do that? You go to Google, type in Ice Cube. <laughs> okay. And occasionally, you know, we are competing with the rapper. Right, yeah. Say, not the rapper. So, but uh, you will find yeah. uh, the web page. I think we are, have become uh, popular enough that you will find our web page. Hopefully, Ice Cube and can you join can take you to talk about Ice Cube at some point. That would be pretty great. And anyone in the audience who wants to send me email, uh, guess what my email is? It's icecube, uh, halzen at icecube.wisc for wisconsin.edu. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Congratulations and good luck with the building the 10 kilometer. When that's done, will you come back and let us let us know what you found? I hope I'm still alive. I'm sure you will be. Thank you so much. Thank you. I All I right. plan to be. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. God, that's awesome. All right. I love Ice Cube so much. Um, all right, Dave, you're on my screen, I guess. Why don't we uh, yes. talk to you about the top astronomy events in 2023? Yeah, 2023 is going to be, it's going to be another interesting year. I've been doing these big roundups now for about a decade. And uh, it's going to basically start off kind of like December with all the planets in the evening sky that we have right now. We have everything, all the classic naked eye planets from Mercury to Saturn lined up. And that's going to go on until early January. Mars, of course, is the coolest one because it just passed opposition. We were talking before the show about the occultation of Mars where the moon passed in front of it last week. And we got some pretty amazing photos out of that. What's cool is the moon's going to occult Mars again five more times in 2023. Uh, probably the most dramatic one is going to be January 31st because that's for North America as well. And the moon's actually going to be a waning gibbous, I believe, at that point. And I always kind of like it when the moon is waning when it occults objects because the dark edge is leading the moon in its path. So you see the object go behind the dark edge first, which is always more dramatic because you don't have to contend, especially when you're trying to photograph it, because you don't have to contend with the glare of the moon itself. So that's going to be cool. Um, there's going to be a good occultation of Jupiter as well. And that's going to be on May 17th uh, when the moon crossed. And that's going to be for, for North America as well. So that's going to be kind of cool. 
Um, eclipses, lunar eclipses, we're kind of uh, not going to really get anything amazing in 2023. We get a penumbral, which is man, like is the the worst of all eclipses for the moon. Then we get a partial eclipse later on. But there are two solar eclipses that are kind of interesting, and I think probably the biggest. Uh, astronomical event, yes. So Michael Zeiler provided this map. As a matter of fact, there's going to be an annular solar eclipse where the moon is too far away and too small to totally cover the sun, and the path is going to go right down across the south uh, western U.S. And the so last annular eclipse it. went through Oregon too, didn't it? There was another one. Yeah, there yeah. was one actually in 20 last year because I saw it as a very deep partial from northern Maine went up over uh, Canada and the Arctic. Yeah, and there's a there's what's called a hybrid eclipse that's going to the only total solar eclipse next year is this one on April 20th that goes over um, the southeast uh, southeast Asia and Australia. A hybrid eclipse is where the the path is annular along one part of the track and it's total along a very narrow section of the track as well, where the moon is just going in close enough to to totally pass in front of the sun. So that's going to be the only total solar eclipse. And of course, this lines us up for the next big ticket solar eclipse, April 8th, 2024, Right, is the next total solar eclipse that everybody is going to be like uh, waiting. I've actually already got a press invite for Lake Placid in New York. So I'm kind of torn because nice. it also goes over, it goes over my hometown in Northern Maine. And it's kind of hubris because the further northeast you go on that track, you look at the, the weather prospects for April 8th of any year, yeah. is uh, the general trend is cloudier toward the northeast, clearer toward the southwest, like yeah. Texas. Mexico. I'm going to be in Texas, I think. Yes. All the big eclipse chasers that don't want to, uh, to, 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 to have hubris with the clouds, but I usually end up going where me and Pamela have terrible records with eclipses, but uh, we'll see. It'd be cool to see one from my old town. Definitely. This, this will be a big one coming up. So we've got some, um, so we've got some Mars occultations. We've got two yes. lunar eclipses. What else have we got in 2023? Um, another one that's kind of interesting. I'm, I generally like to boil things down to the very best of the best. Uh, Venus is going to be very close to Jupiter on March 1st, and that's going to be in the dusk. They're going to be about one full moon apart. And I always get messages from people about what are those two bright things in the sky that you see? How come I never noticed those two dark? bright stars yeah, together before? Yeah. Whenever, and this happens once or twice every year where Venus, uh, Jupiter laps Venus, and this occurs. You remember we had Jupiter and Saturn paired together very near Christmas a few years ago, and that there was a lot of general, I was showing a lot of people on our apartment rooftop that, that anybody that wanted to see it, that they knew I'm the space guy in the apartment. So they would say, what, what's this I'm hearing in the news about uh, Saturn and it being the closest in five minutes? It's like, come up to the roof tonight, I'll, I'll show you. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, so we, we would do that. Um, comets, we don't have anything on tap, but of course, you know, a bright naked eye comet could come by at any time. Or, and you know, this is our year, we're Dave. Overdue. This is it, 2023, this overdue. is the one. There's a few eighth or ninth magnitude ones. Probably the most interesting one I found looking around is Comet, periodic comet 96 Macholtz in January is going to pass perihelion and it might reach uh, plus second magnitude, which is decent naked eye, but it's going to be near the sun. So it's going to be very tough. Uh, that was one of Don Macholtz's discoveries, uh, yeah. prolific comet discovery. He just passed away. That We lost a few big. Uh, yeah, this year. Astronomy community this year. Don Macholtz, um, um, Mr. Eclipse, Fred Espinac, he died. Yeah. yeah, so it's uh it's it's too it's been kind of a sad year for amateur astronomy. Yeah. Um next year's a good year for the Perseids and Geminids because they fall nearish the new moon. Unlike this week, uh we have the moon to kind of contend with in the sky. But you know, I've seen so, some pretty good reports. And Geminids and the Perseids are always the two big showers we always watch for that are good, uh, dependable showers. Uh, the torrid fireballs might be good this year because Comet Enki is reaching perihelion. So that always is a good year around November or so to keep an eye out for them. There's also another shower that used to be uh, produce meteor storms called the Andromedids in early December. This shower used to produce some of the great meteor storms of the 19th century, seems to be making a comeback hasn't produced that kind of level, but there's some predictions in 2023 I came across that said early December 
uh, we may see a, a moderate outburst from the shower. Mm. Remember, we had the tile Hercules earlier this year that got everybody out yep. looking for that. Oh, I saw a few. It was kind of interesting. We got some fireballs, course, so, but not not yeah. the storm. I saw a couple. Yeah, yeah, not the storm we predicted. Yep. Um, the, the solar cycle, of course, is ramping up. That's going to be a big deal because it, it reaches its peak for solar cycle 25 next year, I think 2023, 2024, we're heading toward max. So you're gonna see a lot of solar activity, a lot of aurora. Um, so the sun is gonna be definitely worth keeping an eye on. Saturn's rings are going toward edge on. This is something that goes in a nine year cycle, widest 2017. Yep. Now they're going toward edge on, I believe it's 2024. Um, Something very strange I came across, but this is going to be, it would be kind of neat to watch with a telescope or binoculars. On February 15th, Neptune passes just one arc minute, less than an arc minute from Venus. So if you've never seen Neptune, you would have brilliant Venus to aim at. Mm -hmm. It would almost look like, like Venus has a little tiny. And I kind of wonder, does it actually occult Neptune? Because that would be super rare. So I actually did a search from north to south on the Earth, and I couldn't find. Like, no, it never gets quite close. Even parallax didn't shift it enough yeah. to uh, actually. Uh, yeah, so those are the ones we know about. Like I said, there could always be meteor outbursts, um, bright naked eye comet. You know, there's there's the, the events we know are going to happen, like eclipses that are definite sure things. And then there's always a few astronomical events that may just like crop up. A, a bright supernova, maybe ice yeah. cube could detect that. Betelgeuse dims. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, we never know. Remember in 2019, were. about this time of year, we were all like, this could be the big news story of 2020. Betelgeuse couldn't be it. Yeah. Little did we know what we were in for in 2020. But right. we all thought it's like, it's that's like the big story yeah it's Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. no no instead we got a pandemic yep. yeah awesome well thanks dave that's that's amazing we're gonna yeah. we'll talk again in a second about the space flight ones but i want to switch over to carolyn who's been waiting patiently to tell us all about comets speaking of the comets that we are that we deserve carolyn well, yeah. And so a lot of these meteor showers that we talk about certainly are because Earth plows through these trails of stuff that's left behind by comets. But it turns out that um, it may be that, the, that they're leaving more than just trails. So there, and the way we know this is that there's this phenomenon called leftover light, and it's been found in Hubble images. And I think it kind of has everybody a little bit stumped about what they could what it could be. So the fellow that that basically just um, he didn't discover, but he wanted to look for it. Roger Winhorst at Arizona State and his team had an idea that they wanted to go through all of the surf through all of these HT, HST images. So they came up with a project called Project Sky Surf, and they wanted to see if this if there this leftover light was showing up in all the images. So these are all images from the wide field planetary cameras and the advanced camera for surveys that have been taken over the last essentially since um, about the time that the telescope was launched. So essentially what they're doing is they're using HST as a photometer, uh, just kind of a light light detector. And it's already sensed this very faint light. And it shows up in most, if not all, of the HST images that they've looked at. So they've gone through and measured the surface brightnesses, sky surface brightness of about 250,000 images. They zeroed in on a specific range of light, wavelength of light, uh, basically 0 0.2 to 1.7 microns. So near infrared and a little bit more. They did some processing. They lifted out the very faint light. Uh, they subtracted out um, the general known surface brightness of the sky. They took out the zodiacal light and they tried to subtract out any you know, stray light from more distant objects. And what they had left is this faint glow that people have noticed. And the big question is, where's it coming from? And long story short, what they've decided is it could be coming from comet dust reflecting and glowing in the sunlight but it's not all in the plane of the solar system. And it's not all in these you know, trains that we see with the comets that, that scattered as they, they go through, but it's arranged more in like a shell or an envelope that is permeating all of interplanetary space. So the conclusion they've come to is that it seems to be, this resi residual light seems to be coming from inside the solar system. And they base this on the fact that more than 95% of the photons in the images from Hubble's archive come from distances of less than about 4 billion kilometers from Earth. So that's inside the solar system. Now that source is something they have to confirm. But it does make sense, you know, as comets travel through the solar system, we know they leave these trains behind. They're 
they're shedding gas and their dust and their bits and pieces of ice. And as the ice sublimates it more, more dust particles come out and it spreads out. Now, eventually, um, you know, they'll know, you know, we'll notice them as meteor showers, but this is really, really very fine dust that makes this cloud. So it's really a shell and um, HST isn't the only detector that's actually seen this shell. Apparently New Horizons has measured it. They're still trying to figure out, you know, where exactly it's coming from, how localized is it. Other possibilities they have to check out and essentially discard before they can say, yes, this is comet dust is extra galactic background sources, possibly mm -hmm. very faint galaxies, uh, something called the extra galactic background light. And that's not really assigned any particular sources. This is a sort of scattered light, accumulated light from a variety of sources. The thing I really found interesting about this was that if this really does exist, we're, we're, we've got a whole new part of the solar system to explore. It's part of the solar system architecture with along with the comets and the planets and the mm -hmm. asteroids and everything else. It's, it's interesting, um, like when you think about like Dave was talking earlier about the meteor showers that you can go and see at specific yeah. times because the, the comet or the asteroid is shedding yeah. particles, but you can go at any night and see a, a bunch of meteors. And mm -hmm. I wonder how many of those are pieces of, you know, we've always described them as little pieces of dust left over from the formation of the solar system. But I wonder how much of those are actually particles produced by comets that have been falling into the inner solar system and just well, that's leaving the, this cloud? That's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the you know, the storms that we see are coming, from, you know, as we plow through these. I always think of them, and I'm not sure that's quite correct, but tubes of, of dust that we're going through that we that we plow through. But, you know, there's probably got to be some element of this. I don't know that they've, you know, that they've really characterized the sizes of these pieces of dust. Obviously, it's comet dust or they're you know, submicron sized or whatever, but, but yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. There was a, there was a really interesting story that we published on universe today after this one. I don't know if you saw it, but, but a, um, back in 2021 astronomers in Alberta saw a really bright fireball hit the, the oh, sky yeah. and yeah. they were yes, able to trace the say. trail back. And they realized that, that the object had come from the Oort cloud. And yes. yeah, I did see that. Yeah. yeah and yeah, they were able to, making the rounds. Yeah. yeah. And they, and they were able to tell the, the depth that the object fell told them that this had to have been more rocky than icy. And, yep. and so now it appears in fact that the Oort cloud probably has more rock in it than we thought. We, we, we imagine the Oort cloud, we imagine comets is just this pristine ice left over from the formation of the solar system, but might actually be that it's more like asteroids covered in ice or ice mixed. Well, with I mean, there, there is, there is the whole idea of the blown out asteroids that, I mean, blown out comets that look like asteroids and asteroids that have more ice than, than you would expect. And yeah, so the, the yeah. idea that there is more rock out there isn't a new one, but it's, but this is sort of like prima facie evidence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, and so, you know, I think we could be at a point in a few years where just what is an asteroid and what is a comet? There is no yeah. distinction. There are, there are icy asteroids and rocky asteroids and metallic asteroids. And, yeah. and they're all just different versions of, of the same thing, which is, which is kind of amazing. Um, well, I think that's kind of cool. I 100% I agree. Uh, all right, Dave, let's talk about the upcoming space flight. For 2023. Yes. Well, this year finally wrapped up. Uh, we saw JWST launch last Christmas. Yeah. And then this year we finally saw Artemis One launch and come back and re-enter over the Pacific this past Sunday. So those were two big things. Something interesting about last year and this year, I realized in research, last year we had more orbital launches uh, that broke the record for the number which was 135, and we're already on track with 170, and it's just not even mid-December. So 2022 will go down as the most orbital launches by far. And half of those are China and SpaceX, yeah. when you yeah. look at the numbers. Yeah, half Alone. China, half SpaceX, so, and then yeah. rounding and then everybody else. everybody else. Yeah. yeah. They're in the noise. So, <laughs> it's amazing how many, you know, keeping up with launches, I almost can't keep up. There's so many a week right now. But... uh yeah, we've got, um, so Artemis 2 probably won't go until 2024 is what yeah. I'm seeing. We may see Starship launch somewhere in early 2023. That's one thing we're tracking. I've been uh, calling it 
I've been predicting March 2023 yeah. now for close to a year. Even though people were like, yeah. it's going to it's gonna launch next month. Elon Musk says, like, it's going to launch next yeah. month. But Elon Musk says a lot of stuff. If you, if you look back at our missions to watch every year, it's like JWST and SLS. It's been, it's been on every list every right, year for right. a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think Dear Moon, the, the crew uh, mission that's supposed to go up and around the moon, I keep seeing 2023, but I don't think no. it's the that they're going to be putting people on Starship. No, no way. That soon. Maybe 2024, 2025. I would be amazed. I would be amazed if the Dear Moon folks fly before the end of the decade. Yeah. Like, yeah. like it, it, it just and, feels uh, like, like they've got to prove, like they've got to have the human launch system land on the moon for NASA, that's going to keep them pretty busy to make sure that that all works and, and building the I, habitat and all that for inside that. No, I, I, I noticed, um, everyday astronauts on the crew. He's yeah, like, I know Tim us. Dodd's on the crew. Yeah. He's totally one of us. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've had him on the show before. Oh yeah. 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 No, so we, he and I've done a bunch of work together. Cool. No, he's a great guy and it, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Yeah. But we have some other lunar missions that are going off too. We just recently had uh, the Hakuto R. We talked about that last time we were on the show. That finally launched this past weekend with the Lunar Flashlight and the Rashi Rover. That's those we're going to see reaching the moon. Uh, they're doing that long trajectory probably early on. And we're going to see a few other missions that were supposed to go this year, like uh, Intuitive Machines and Astrobotics. Those are going to go on uh, ULA's Vulcan rocket and uh, SpaceX Falcon 9, respectively. No no Mars missions this year. I don't know if we talked last yeah. time, but this is the first opposition. ESA's ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover was supposed to make the trip. Then the Ukraine war happened. Russia was providing the landing platform in the Proton rocket. So they're scrambling now to maybe get Rosalind Franklin there. But this is the first time since I believe 2009 that that humanity has missed the Mars window. Yeah. So, you, so the U.S., was, it looks like the U.S. is going to be supplying the launch system. And the Europeans are probably going to build their own sky crane for, yeah. the, for the landing at this point. Yeah. Um, Indian Space Agency, ISRO, is going to be kind of busy. They're doing the their Chandrayaan-3 moon mission is going. Remember, their Vikram lander uh, failed, but uh, Chandrayaan-2 did pretty well. This one is going to be a combination of orbiter, um, lander, rover as well. Oh. Uh, they also want to start doing uh, crewed missions. I came across that, too, that the Indian Space Agency is going to start doing their own yep. uh, orbital crewed launches. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, course, it's going to be amazing China's to have another for, nation sending another humans nation to space, human capable of sending humans to space. space. Yeah. Probably the biggest missions I think that everybody's going to be watching is uh, Psyche, of course, to the asteroid Psyche, uh, still on track to launch on Falcon Heavy in October. And the JUICE uh, European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Uh, this will be European Space Agency's first uh, Jupiter mission that's going on an Ariane 5 in April. That seems to be on track anyway, right now for next year. Those are going to be the two big planetary missions. I'm and amazed Lab. that like juice just snuck up on me. I I yes. was, you know, I sort of imagine Europa Clipper and Juice together, but actually Juice is ready to go, ready to fly, and is is going to be heading out next year, and is going to be coming right up in April. Yeah, and it's going to be reaching like what twenty twenty six. Yes. Yeah, and then it'll be starting to do. It'll take a while. To get close there. up observations, but mainly around Ganymede. Which is, you know, my opinion, Ganymede is the new Europa. Ganymede yes. has a subsurface ocean like Europa, but it has its own magnetosphere. It's bigger, more massive. It's farther away from Jupiter, and so it has less radiation load than Europa has. I'm really excited about what it's going to find at, at Ganymede compared to in Europa. In, in Juno's doing its inner flyby, speaking of the Galilean moons, um, IO, it's going to be doing a very close flyby uh, yeah. in 2023 as well. So we're going to, now they're able to take more risks with the mission. So they're doing those uh, secondary goals of uh, doing those closer in flybys of those missions there. 
And another interesting thing is Osiris Rex toward the end of next year is finally going to bring, bring its samples of Venu back. So we're going to be seeing that That's amazing. as well. That's going to be a big news story. Yeah, that took a long time to go through. <laughs> We've been following that mission for quite yeah. some time. Well, I was there for the launch. And yes, that's right, you guys. I never saw that. It was one of the few Florida launches I actually didn't go yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of amazing that the whole thing is coming around to, to wrap up now. Rocket Lab wants to do a Venus mission, I believe, in 2023. They're going to start this coming, I think it's Friday, they're launching from Wallops, not the, not the Venus mission, right. but Rocket Lab, the company, they're finally doing, uh, uh, they've been launching from New Zealand for years. They're starting their uh, their second launch site. Uh, it's been going up at Wallops Island, not far from where I used to live in Norfolk. And yeah, so the, the breakthrough is, I think, breakthrough, they're doing the mission, and then and then Rocket Lab is supplying the launcher for the Venus Life Finder mission. Yes, I believe that's going next year. I, yeah. I came across that they want to do a Venus, thing. probably using a photon kick stage like they did with Capstone. They've already, Rocket Lab's already done a lunar mission. Mm -hmm. Capstone has is, is, uh, re successfully reached the moon just recently. So they're going to be starting to do, you're going to see more interplanetary small missions that are coming up too. There's yeah, already that's really field. exciting. But yeah, no, it's it's amazing. Like I said, how many rocket launches there've been, and it's we almost I think I don't think we're quite going to break two hundred this year, but that's that's an amazing pace. Yeah, uh, for SpaceX alone with their Starlink launches, uh, there've been a couple of weeks sometimes. It's amazing the kind of pace they've been keeping up. Very cool. All right. Well, speaking of Venus, is there magma yes. on Venus? Well, yeah, and this is not exactly a mission next year, but. Uh, the European Space Agency is building, starting to build the, in, um, let's see, I guess they're calling it the Envision mission. And it's one of three. So NASA and ESA are actually working together on these. And the other two are Veritas and Da Vinci Plus. I guess that's called Da Vinci Plus, yeah. right? And so when you add the, and, the, the Venus Life Finder, you've got four missions going yeah, to Venus yeah, yeah. in the next few years. Yeah, and there's a lot of questions that we, they want to answer about Venus. I mean, sort of the overarching one, like why it's such a hellish environment and how it got to be the way it is, what's its history, what happened to it. Um, and the big one is, is it volcanic now? Because you look at, so, you know, the old Magellan uh, original radar scans, I mean, you see all this evidence of volcanism. We haven't seen anything, you know, of actual, you know, lava flowing across the surface and like you're not going to really see that. Um, but what they want to do is both scan both the surface and underneath the surface. So what, what Envision has got is a uh, surface penetrating radar that they're going to use to basically sound beneath the surface. So transmit signals at about nine me megahertz. And um, the materials underneath, underneath the, the surface would bounce back, echo back a signal, and that would be able to tell what kind of material, what kind of structure underneath the surface is bouncing back that signal based on what's in the fingerprint of the signal. Um, it would tell you about the uh, the composition of the subsurface, um, tell you about structures, you know, are there faults underneath there, are there volcanic plumes or tubes or, you know, extent of lava flows. So here's a, this is a Magellan image that was a Magellan radar scan. So that used synth synthetic aperture radar to scan the surface. And so you see these huge built up volcanic mountains. And so is it happening now? That's the question. This radar would also be able to tell you about any of the lava flows, any vents, the geology of the surface features, buried craters, you know, whatever there is. So just as a quick example, you say, let's say it probes and it finds a location of a lava tube or a plume, or maybe it looks beneath a smooth plane and it sees almost, if you know what a palimpsest is, it's sort of a ghost image of a crater that's been buried by lava. This is all evidence of volcanism. All the other, you know, instruments should be able to tell us whether or not there's actual live volcanism going. Uh, Envision is one of the is one of those instruments with a surface penetrating radar that should tell you the structures are there underneath. Now we need to, you know, prove that there's actual lava flowing through there right now, telling us something about the interior of the planet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the so the resolution of Magellan is like. I forget it was like 30 meters, a hundred meters. It's something. Terrible. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. crap. And it was like blocks were being ignored, you know? Because yeah. Yeah. So you just don't stuff. get that yeah. resolution to be able to make, yeah. to sense those kind of fine tuned features. And when you think about the resolution of say the lunar reconnaissance orbiter or the Mars reconnaissance mm -hmm. orbiter, I mean, mm -hmm. they can see objects that are sub meter. They can see things yeah. in some cases that are 20, 30 centimeters across right. on the surface right. of those worlds. And Magellan, the best, 
synthetic aperture radar that's been able to go so far is being able to see 30 meters and, and above. And so it's just, or it probably, tells you that there's a rough yeah, surface. I feel like it's hundred meters. Yeah. I forget. I, I, I had this piece of information in my brain, but anyway, it's, it's mm -hmm. terrible. It's garbage. And so, uh, this mission will change everything in, a, in mapping out mm -hmm. the surface of, of Venus to a degree that, that we've just never seen before. Well, I think it's all three amazing. of them will. And also because of, you know, long-term studies, you, if something changes on a surface, that will definitely tell you yeah. smoking gun. Okay. Something, something flowed here, but it's so tricky because Venus has this horrible atmosphere. Like if it didn't have yeah. this awful choking atmosphere, then it would be easy to take high resolution images of the surface, yeah. but it doesn't. It's, it's, it's opaque without some other mechanism. And, and that's why they've got this synthetic aperture radar. It's very cool. Right, right. All right, we've just got a couple of minutes left. So one, Artemis one wrapped up, hooray, Orion landed yeah. splashdown safely, the mission's over. Um, I just released a new video all about it. So if you wanted to sort of watch the whole mission beginning to end, we just, uh, we just did that. And actually NASA released an amazing supercut. It's like 25 minutes long of, of footage of the entire that. Yeah. mission. Yeah. It's amazing. So it's, you know, I was whining and complaining about the quality of the, of the video early on, but just seeing all this to come together and it's just going to be amazing once they actually download all of the files post them up on the internet. I'm really looking forward to all that. Oh, just the, the landing, looking out the window as we were, as it was coming into a landing cool spot. Watch, yeah. And it was like coming Everywhere. in, like you're on an airplane, only you're at much higher altitude. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Also great. Um, and then the other big piece of news this week, of course, is that the National Ignition Facility achieved a fusion breakthrough. They put two megajoules of laser power they they zapped a a little pellet that was filled with uh, tritium and deuterium with 192 high power lasers and they put in about two megajoules of energy into it and they were able to release through the power something. of fusion about 3.15 megajoules yeah. of of energy now that's amazing because up until this point through this method, they've never been able to achieve more energy out than they put energy in. Like they've been able to do fusion. Like when you think about this yeah. long, this long list of to-do yeah. items, right? You've got fusion. Okay, check. We've done that for for thirty years. <laughs> and the next one yeah. is more energy out than we put in to, this week. Check. So, so the then the next step is make scale it up make it depend reliable dependable figure out a way to extract the energy figure out a way to to make the whole thing safe uh connect up to the grid and so on and so forth so you know the the joke is always that fusion is 30 years away but i, I really kind of feel that fusion is like 29 years away now um but the other thing that's really interesting <laughs> is that <laughs> actually so alan boyle wrote a story about it f for yeah. us on on universe today and one really interesting implication of this is not for base load power generation so that you can run your microwave and your refrigerator, but for space exploration, because, you know, the tritium and deuterium, the fuel source is actually incredibly expensive and complicated and difficult to make. It's not, we're not, we're not really going to unlock this until we've got large, like much larger facilities that can do hydrogen pure straight up hydrogen that then, you know, then we're, they're talking, but you could take those, put them up into space, some kind of spacecraft, and then have this laser system that's going with it. That's shooting lasers at the, at the fuel source and generating an enormous amount of heat that you're using for, to, you know, heat up a propellant and blast it out the back of your spacecraft. This could be the expanse. We could be looking at a new, mm -hmm spacecraft well, propulsion energy. system yeah. in in you know the, the far future 30 years you know how it goes so anyway yeah. it's an amazing accomplishment um they gotta hurry up i'm getting old uh, yeah i know yeah. I'm, I'm like fusion <laughs> drive but well i still... like the statement that somebody made today saying okay now we've done this it's in the hands of the engineers that's exactly yeah. it make yeah. it happen yeah, yeah yeah and 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 one of the other things that was really amazing about this was you know the amount of energy that you put in like like Physicists were certain that if they put in, say, five megajoules of energy in, then fusion is guaranteed. 
but to do it with only two, that was yeah. right on the line for what would be possible. And the only way they were able to do it was with really good optics on the laser systems, really careful control of the pulses that the lasers were firing, really good, sort of a perfect spherical um, fuel source. Like there was a lot of really clever physics and engineering that came together to be able to make this accomplishment happen. Uh, so someone, uh, Zafin Zafin is mentioning about uh, the tokamak. So this is the, this is an inertia based high mm -hmm. energy plasma system. And the tokamak is the completely other way of producing fusion as well, which is people are racing to try and reach energy positiveness with the tokamak reactors as well. So we could very well have two separate paths that let's achieve fusion. And so it's, uh, it's great. It's great. I mean, it's, you know, again, like don't, don't call up your power company and ask if you can have fusion power yet. But, but I love that quote that they've handed over the problem to the engineers. That's always a wonderful time. So we're still a few years away from Mr. Fusion powering our cars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, our turn travel device. <laughs> All right. Your batteries for a smartphone. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. Well, we've reached the end of our show. So, uh, Dave, I want to let you know uh, what are you working on and where can people find out more? Uh, yes, I'm at Astro Guys with a Z on Twitter, and I am at Astro Dave at uh, Astrodon.social on Mastodon now. So I'm starting to uh, parallel posts over there as well. And I'm the author of two hard copy books, Universe Today's Ultimate Guide to Observing the Cosmos, which the events are still good for 2023 and 2024 until they're until running out of time edition. to to so, publish a new version of the book. They better get on that. I'm kicking around the idea of, of asking if they want a second edition. I could yeah. uh, I could do another mm -hmm. decade or so. So and I'm writing a big post for Universe Today on all the astronomy events, probably in that gap week between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, all the astronomy events to watch for in 2023 and sky and telescope i'm doing uh space flight events to watch for in 2023 as well that all sounds amazing right now so all right carolyn well you can find me at universe today the space i'm on twitter at at space writer and for the next few weeks i'm actually taking vacation nice cool. i'll allow it yeah uh, thank you like I have any control over this. Uh, and of course, I you can also find my work at Universe Today. And like I said, the, the thing that I'm pretty excited about was this new video we just published about the Artemis 1 mission. So if you want like a full recap, how we got to Artemis, how the mission went, and what, what the future holds for the Artemis missions, definitely check that out. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. Thanks to our special guests. Thanks to the moderators. Thanks to Nancy for organizing everything in advance. Um... This is the last episode, and then we will be back next year. So uh, you've got 2023. three weeks before we're back. Anyway, uh, I'm sure you'll you'll find your way back to us. There you go. Uh, yeah, 21st, no show, 28th, no show, and then we're back. So we'll see you in the new year. Thank you, everyone. Have a good holiday. I know I will.